Right, so we've been hearing about some amazing, exciting technology. I'd like to step back a little bit and think about what the likely impacts of this technology are going to be on society and ask how can we ensure that it's going to have a positive effect. So people, a lot of people seem to feel like we're on the verge of major social transformation due to this technology, but people in AI have been saying that for 50 years. So are we, how can we be sure? How do we know that now it's really happening? Uh, one place to look is at the economics. Uh, McKinsey, the consulting firm, did a very nice analysis of a bunch of advanced technologies and their likely impact over the next 10 years. And if you add up the AI and robotics technologies, uh, you get a total impact, positive value creation of $50 trillion. And this is huge. I mean, if you compare it, just for context, the United States GDP is about $18 trillion. So if their estimate is correct, we're talking about a major economic impact on the world. So let's break it down and sort of get a sense of where this impact is likely to happen. Uh, the biggest impact, $25 trillion, is on uh, knowledge work, AI knowledge work, things like modeling the internal functions of companies, enterprise resource planning, uh, doing better marketing, we're seeing that big time right now, analyzing big data, smart assistants, lots and lots of effort in that area. Uh, Internet of Things is estimated to be about $15 trillion, 100 billion devices by 2025, measuring and acting on every aspect of industrial processes, of cars, of our human health, so that's a huge area. Uh, robotic manufacturing, about $10 trillion. Uh, China is in this big time. There are 420 Chinese robot companies right now, and they are busily uh, converting a lot of their manufacturing plants uh, to automation. There are 1,500 uh, robot replace human projects going on, and uh, they've been very successful so far. Why? Uh, robotic in, uh, automation, well, robots will work 24 hours a day, they don't need breaks, they don't need food, they don't need medical care, they don't quit, they don't get bored, they don't get depressed, they'll work anywhere, they're happy to work in hazardous environments, they don't leak secrets, industrial secrets, uh, they work well with others, and perhaps the most important thing is once you've trained a robot to do some task, you can then copy that software essentially for free and get as many robots as you want doing that task, and so there's essentially zero training cost after the first one. So all of these forces are, are making uh, industrial robotics a huge thing. Uh, healthcare, about a $10 trillion impact. Uh, robotic surgery is one exciting area. Uh, medical records, doing diagnosis, we heard about some of that earlier. Um, Self-driving vehicles, uh, lots and lots of interest there. There are at least 28 companies down doing this, about $10 trillion impact over the next 10 years. Uh, very, very disruptive to the way things are done here. If we replaced all current vehicles by self-driving vehicles, it would totally disrupt uh, car dealerships, uh, insurance companies, the parking industry, the uh, car finance industry. Uh, so about 10 million jobs potentially uh, at risk there. Um, U.S. building industry is about $1 trillion. And uh, uh, last year, the Chinese company Winsun 3D printed this 1,200 square foot villa in a few days. So potential huge impact of uh, 3D printing, robotics, and AI in, in that industry, 5.8 million employees. So because of all of this potential, huge low-hanging fruit, there are lots and lots of startups. Venture Scanner is a nice place to look. They're tracking uh, 1,630 AI startups right now with uh, $12 billion of investment. But uh, things are getting much bigger than that. Uh, the president of SoftBank, the Japanese company, uh, recently announced that they're trying to start a $100 billion vision fund uh, driven primarily by the idea of uh, developing superintelligent AI. So that gives you a sense of the scale. Of course, it makes sense. If $50 trillion of AI is going to be created, $100 billion of investment is perfectly reasonable. So that's fantastic for people who are entrepreneurs in this area. Um, so how's this going to happen? What are the changes that are going to happen? The things I've mentioned so far are basically uh, automating the low-hanging fruit in our economy, so sort of economic transformation. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to have three waves. The first wave will be something I call the AI economy. Uh, and each of these three waves has potential uh, challenges associated with it. In the AI economy, there's the risk of technological unemployment, people losing their jobs, of increasing inequality, of the use of AI for manipulation, propaganda purposes, and we need to find ways to counteract the negatives of that. 
The second wave is AI military. Basically, every uh, big country on the planet right now is developing uh, autonomous, lethal weapons of various forms, drones, uh, robotic soldiers. Uh, this could have both positive and negative uh, views. On the one hand, if warfare turns into our robots against their robots, that's great. Maybe people won't be killed. On the other hand, if humans aren't going to be harmed, that may lower the bar to starting wars, so it may increase warfare. It also enables a kind of autonomous robot terrorism that could be uh, risky, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of issues there. Finally, in the longer term, I think every aspect of human society is going to be transformed by these technologies. We're going to clearly need new regulatory capabilities, uh, ways to ensure that these systems are working in, in a positive way. It's probably going to necessitate changing our legal system so that it covers these systems, and we also need new forms of enforcement. I mean, we're already struggling with that in things like cyber warfare, where we can't even figure out often who it is that launched an attack and what do you do about it. <clears throat> so uh, we've heard a little bit already today about technological unemployment. People have been making various uh, predictions about uh, how much displacement of jobs are likely to be. I just thought it was sort of amusing that one week ago, uh, Kai-Fu Lee, a very prominent uh, and respected venture capitalist in China right now, uh, predicted that artificial intelligence will replace half of all jobs uh, in the next decade. So in 10 years, he's talking about half of all jobs being displaced by AI. That's the most extreme prediction I have seen. And then yesterday, Eric Schmidt of Alphabet said that he is a technological unemployment denier. He thinks that no jobs are going to be displaced. Basically, people are going to get new jobs. My own view is, any, today at least, any job that a robot can do is a job probably people shouldn't be doing. So great, let the robots do those jobs. We need to focus on finding things that are uniquely human that people can do. But it's going to be clearly a disruptive uh, uh, force. So just to sort of get a sense of what some of the issues are as these technologies uh, come to be integrated into our society, it's interesting, you know, over the past year or so, we've started to see more AI systems showing up in various places, and we're starting to see some of the very human issues that those give rise to. So I thought I'd go through a few examples that sort of just give us a framing to think about what some of the issues we may have to deal with. Uh, the first one was uh, the Stanford Shopping Center, which is just a few miles from here, uh, a year ago or so, had these very nice security robots that would go around and look and they had cameras and see if anything uh, was, was going wrong. And this young uh, toddler thought these robots were really, really cool, and he decided to run over and try and hug the robot. And unfortunately, the robot was not programmed for this, and it ran over the toddler. Unfortunately, just gave him a little bit of a, uh, a sore, but it was something that uh, the developers of the robot hadn't thought about, that uh, some of the people in the mall might try and hug it. And so it's an example of a challenge that was not foreseen in the original development. I think they pulled the robots out, and they've reprogrammed them, and I think they're coming back in. Uh, the autonomous vehicles is a very interesting and exciting uh, <clears throat> situation. Um, lots of struggle with governments all around the world. Governments both see that this is the future, so they want the autonomous vehicles on their roads. On the other hand, it's a very early technology, and so they don't want, they want to make sure that they're not risky. Uh, Tesla has their autopilot mode, and uh, last summer they sort of launched it big time, and there were a number of accidents. I think uh, during the summer there were seven accidents. One was a fatality. Uh, lots of people studied that. Lots of questions about, uh, you know, what does that mean? Um, I really like the self-driving car domain because it's a great example of a, a situation that we understand pretty well how to regulate cars for humans. You know, we have speed limits, we have traffic lights, uh, and it's a constrained domain. And so as we think about the issues when autonomous uh, <coughs> vehicles go into those situations, it allows us to think about some of the ethical questions in a clear way. So philosophers have been thinking about ethics for thousands of years, and they have come up with some fairly simple toy problems that help them get at core issues. And one of the favorite problems was what are called uh, trolley problems. And the self-driving car analog of that is, imagine your self-driving car is driving down the freeway, and there's a truck in front of it that has a load, and the back of the truck opens up and the load falls down on the freeway, and the car is about to smash into the load, maybe killing the driver, or it can go over to the next lane, 
but there's a motorcyclist there and it'll probably run into the motorcyclist and kill him. So the choice the car has to make is, do I risk killing my driver or do I risk killing this motorcyclist? How do we decide? The ethicists say, well, maybe if the motorcyclist is younger that their life should be preferred and so on. Uh, I think economic issues are gonna come in. We're likely to see maybe a company like Hummer saying, you know, our cars and our trucks always uh, serve to save the life of the driver. You know, no matter who else is at stake. Maybe. And so we're going to see interesting sort of game theoretic ethical issues showing up. Uh, and if, let's say your car is driving along, your self-driving car, and it knows the car next to it, it knows the brand, and it knows what its algorithm is. And so if it's a kind of a wimpy algorithm, it might figure out, oh, I could just cut in front of that car. It has to slow down and let me in. And so that may create sort of complex interactions on the freeways. Uh, one version of that that you sometimes see around here, uh, Google and a number of other companies are test driving a lot of their autonomous vehicles here, so you often see them. They tend to make them very, very conservative. You see these little cars, sometimes people call them clown cars, that uh, drive quite slowly, and if it looks like there might be, they really don't want to run into pedestrians because that would be very bad press. So if it looks like a pedestrian is going to cross the road, the car is very conservative and will stop and wait for the pedestrian. Well, the pedestrians figure this out, and they think it's really fun to kind of act like they're going to go in front of the car. Then the car stops and they say, no, I'm not going to go. And the car starts up and they act like they're going to go. So it's sort of a uh, self-driving pedestrian chicken. And so how do you deal with that? So every time you have autonomous systems that interact with people, you get unexpected uh, responses from those people. And it needs to be thought through as we uh, integrate these into our society. Uh, one other example that... Uh, uh, a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion about. There's a company called Cambridge Analytica in Britain who is claiming that they modeled, based on Facebook likes and such things, they modeled the personality type of every US citizen and that they were able to target advertising for the election uh, to, based on people's personality type and that they maybe skewed the election. They're also claiming they maybe skewed the uh, Brexit uh, election and also elections in Australia. People are arguing, did they really do it or didn't they? But the possibility is certainly there that they did. And so we need to think as a society, uh, do we want uh, AI systems building models that might shape uh, political decisions? Um, the uh, Amazon Echo has been a very, very successful device with uh, good speech recognition and a really nice user interaction that little kids absolutely love. Uh, kids love talking to the Amazon, to, to Alexa is her name. Uh, they love talking to her because she never complains. Uh, you can, they can ask her to tell jokes. She always tells funny jokes. Uh, parents are a little iffy because Alexa does not care if you say please or thank you. And so the kids tend to adopt a sort of commanding tone, which they then start using on a, a real people also. So a little bit of a challenge there. Well, there was a funny story uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, a young girl uh, really loved Alexa, and she would play with Alexa and ask her things. She said, Alexa, will you play dollhouse with me? Alexa, buy me a dollhouse. And uh, at the time, the Alexa was set up. Amazon really wants people to be able to order things by this nice voice interface. And so apparently, it ordered her a very expensive $150 dollhouse. And so her parents were not pleased with this, but it was a funny story. And so the local news station said, oh, let's get them on the news and let's show this. And so they asked her, what did you say uh, to get this uh, dollhouse? And she says, oh, uh, Alexa, buy me a dollhouse. Well, this went out on the news. So anybody who was watching the news with their Alexa there, there, Alexa heard that news and started ordering dollhouses. So dollhouses are flying around the country. <laughs> so an unexpected consequence. And that one is interesting because it involves the interaction of multiple systems interacting in ways that you wouldn't necessarily have thought about. A more extreme version of that happened in 2010 when there was the so-called flash crash in which the stock markets, the Dow Industrials dropped 9% uh, in 36 minutes. One trillion dollars of value was lost and then a lot of it was regained. And it came from, people believe, the interaction of lots of auto automatic trading systems interacting with one another and following each other. Nobody's completely sure to this day exactly why it happened. But today, 50% of all trades on the stock market are high frequency trading bots with no human involved. And so we have a very complex system uh, with lots of little autonomous, not very smart at the moment, but soon to be smarter, agents interacting with one another can lead to very unexpected consequences. Uh, 
again, on the sort of unexpected consequences, uh, drones, consumer drones, are a very uh, exciting product. Lots of people are buying them. Price has dropped quite a bit. In China, you could get little micro drones for 50 bucks now with cameras on them. Well, it turns out ISIS, the terrorist group in the Middle East, they've started buying consumer drones and using them to drop hand grenades on people. And so we have the uh, militarization or t uh, weaponization of consumer technology. So uh, this is a, both exciting, we see incredible possibility, incredible positive value, and also a lot of potential unexpected consequences and problems. Um, so these are sort of what, the analog of, what, of to the software systems today that have bugs. So today we have serial software that has bugs like dangling pointers and type error conversions and so on. Uh, you'd think those would be done by now, but we still often see ship programs that crash. Uh, parallel systems, distributed systems have new kinds of bugs. Uh, they can get stuck in deadlocks, they can have race conditions. Uh, systems that are meant to be secure, like the interface for your bank account, they have things uh, that do, for instance, encryption. Those can have security bugs. People can break into those systems even if the software is written correctly. And finally, there's a whole slew of hardware bugs that are coming uh, to the fore where uh, the hardware is not behaving the way one might have imagined it would. And so these four are the types of issues that we are dealing with a lot today, and almost every week we hear about new security holes and hardware problems uh, uh, in the news. So it's a struggle. Well, once systems start using machine learning routinely and once they start making their own decisions, particularly uh, based on uh, goal-driven behavior, we get a whole new series of bugs that we're going to need to deal with, which will require an extension of our theoretical understanding. Uh, so just to list uh, four of them, there are machine learning bugs. Several people have mentioned the challenge that you build this wonderful deep learning system that does a great job, say, of distinguishing dogs from cats. You have no idea how it does that. You can look at the million weights and they have, there's no semantic meaning that is understandable to a person. So these networks are sort of inscrutable. And the problem with that is if we have a self-driving car, say that's uh, built on a trained uh, deep learning neural net, uh, you may think, may understand it perfectly how it's going to behave in normal circumstances, but in some abnormal circumstance, you may have no clue what it's going to do. And so how do we get uh, confidence that our system is going to behave in a positive and safe way? Similarly, people have discovered that you can generate new examples which uh, deep learning systems tend to give the wrong answers on. They call them adversarial examples. So those are challenge, technical challenges that we have to deal with. For goal-driven systems, most of today's systems don't have goals, but very soon we will, where instead of programming it specifically for doing a certain task, we give it some goal and let it figure out the best way to do it. Well, sometimes the, the solution, the best way to do something may involve things that we didn't think of, which may not be uh, a positive social impact. So we're going to need some kind of governance system to constrain the behavior of these systems in a way that doesn't, just like we have to constrain the behavior of people uh, to behave in, in pro-social positive ways. but. Uh, if you've got intelligence systems, you make a law, uh, part of the goal of an intelligence system will be to find the loopholes in those laws. So we need a whole new science of how do you create laws that successfully constrain the behavior of intelligence systems. And finally, when we have collections of multiple AIs interacting, uh, there are potentially collective intelligence bugs that we need to deal with. So how can we ensure that these amazing technologies which are arising actually meet human needs? So there's a lot of thinking in the psychology world about what it is to have a good human life, uh, but a framework I find very nice and useful to think about uh, was from Abraham Maslow back in the 1940s. He actually did his work again a few miles from here. In the 1940s, most psychologists were studying rats. They would, you know, look and see behavioralism was the thing. They're trying to see, oh, to train a rat to do a maze, you shock him here and this and that. Well, Maslow wasn't interested in rats at all. Uh, he was fascinated by his professors. He had two professors who he felt had wonderful lives. They were very smart, very insightful, really seemed to be compassionate, good people who were doing what they loved and really uh, living a wonderful life. So he analyzed, he decided that's what his focus was going to be. And he built the famous uh, Maslow hierarchy of human needs. And his idea was that there's a sort of base level, which are physiological needs like food, water, shelter. And if you don't have those, everything else is toast. On top of that, you have safety needs. If you're having to worry about somebody robbing your house every day, it's hard to do, do anything beyond that. So you need basic level of safety. Above that, you need 
need social needs, you need uh, friendships, love relationships, uh, connections of different kinds. Above that, you need your esteem needs. You need to feel like you're uh, doing your work competently and interacting with society in a positive way. On top of that, you have self-actualization needs, which is a deep sense that many people have of what their real purpose in life is. And when they find that job or that avocation which meets that need, they are really you know, feeling like they're really doing what they're meant to do. And then he found a few people who had what he called tra self-transcendence needs, which are people who connected with something much larger than themselves. Uh, not many examples of that, but he did find that as a possible sort of top of the pyramid. So we can use this, I think, as a framework for thinking about the impact of AI systems on our society. Uh, AI and robotics impacts every one of these levels, and it can impact it in either a positive way or a negative way. And so I sort of had the idea that there is a uh, Maslow uh, dystopia and a Maslow utopia. So the Maslow dystopia is down at the physiological level. Uh, robotics uh, creates uh, massive technological unemployment, so lots of people are unemployed. Huge inequality increases, so <clears throat> uh, we get dislocation in society. People are feeling frustrated. Safety needs uh, it makes it easier to attack one another. Warfare is maybe more common, uh, easier to do. Terrorism is more common. The social level, maybe people get sucked down into virtual reality pornography or you know, some of the issues that we have with social networks now. At the esteem level, people may feel like they can't do anything useful, that they're sort of a, uh, useless beings in the world. The self-actualization level, uh, it may uh, lead to sort of depression. And so this is what we want to avoid, but if we're not careful, we could easily go there. What we want is sort of a utopia level, where at the physiological level, these technologies are gonna create vast amounts of wealth that should be able to make every human on the planet uh, wealthy beyond uh, imagination uh, if we can find the social structure to distribute it in a way uh, that everybody can take advantage of this wealth. The safety level, uh, there are new technologies like on the blockchain, there's something called uh, smart contracts which can enable groups that might be in conflict with one another to uh, create uh, algorithmic software solutions rather than resorting to um, military or physical conflict. At the social level, there's potential for people to connect on deeper, deeper ways or connections. There's possibility for people and AI systems to work in harmony together to be, uh, uh, get the advantages of each. Uh, at the esteem level, new tools for creating artwork, for expressing beauty, for uh, helping people sort of find their inner spark and uh, being, let's say you love music and you have musical ideas, but you're not very good with uh, uh, musical instruments. Well, there may be an AI system that can take your idea of your music and express it in a way uh, very, very quickly and easily. Uh, similarly, at the self-actualization and self-transcendence levels, uh, if we build these systems correctly, there should be a new flowering potential of human potential. So how's this all gonna happen and who's gonna do it? Is it gonna be governments? Is it gonna be countries? Well, I think the first step in that direction happened earlier this year down at Asilomar. Uh, Asilomar is a wonderful retreat center near the uh, ocean near Monterey. And 50 years ago, the biotechnologists realized that their technology was about to have huge impacts, and if they didn't manage it correctly, it could have very negative consequences. They gathered a bunch of people from all over the world, and they created the Asilomar guidelines for biotechnology, which for the last 50 years have kept us safe and have led the development of that field in a very positive way. So a group called uh, the Beneficial AI group met there earlier in January, and they created a similar set of guidelines for AI systems to try and guide them in positive pro-human directions. All the big tech companies were there and they all signed off on these guidelines. So that's, I think, a very positive uh, uh, step. So in conclusion, uh, I think the future is very bright. Uh, there's going to be need for new ideas in how to govern these systems, uh, new technologies for creating them in a way that they are controllable and uh, definitely oriented towards human good. Uh, there's going to be tremendous need for new startups, so it's wonderful news for uh, this conference and for everybody here, and I think huge opportunity uh, awaits us. Thank you.